everyone, welcome to the Auto Car Show. Now, I'm pretty excited about what I'm going to test drive today and I know a lot of you have been waiting for this review because it's the first time an Indian manufacturer is producing a global SUV. Yes, I'm talking about the M&M XUV 500. I've got my hands on it today for a test drive. Now, it's a lot of firsts for Mahindra and Mahindra, a monocoque, a lot of new technology. So I'm trying to get my hands behind the wheel. But whilst I get in, you take a look at the car because I think the styling is really sexy. The XUV has a very aggressive look about it. The front has the typical M&M grille, but that's just a small portion that sits atop a very large bumper with cuts flowing out like a cat's whiskers. The headlights have two eyeball-like lamps underlined by the dots of the daytime running LED lights. Now when you look at the front, you begin to realize what the teaser campaign with the Cheetah was all about. The side profile is less animal with its three almost equal glass areas. It makes it a little more MUV than SUV. But then, there are the really large bulging circular portions above the wheel arches that are there to remind you that this is all muscle. They land up making the 235-65 R17 tyres look a little puny. The waistline has a crease that runs from the front to the rear broken by a circular crease over the rear wheel arch. The rear of the car has a smallish glass area and small bumper with a large tailgate area. The highlight here is the tail light with the horizontal ridges dividing it into four sections. It also has a kink that runs over to the side and there are little motifs imprinted into all the white areas. It's sort of a mixed reaction when you look at the XUV. You sometimes feel that there's too much styling and maybe less could be more, but when you see the overall picture, it definitely makes you turn around and give it a second look. So there's a lot of funky stuff on the interior of the XUV 500 as well, like this conversation mirror that I'm talking to you in. You're looking out of the eyes of the front passenger and I'm sitting at the rear and having a conversation with you. So the front passenger really doesn't have to crane his neck around to the back every time he wants to talk to someone at the rear. Or then you can keep an eye on your kids if they're messing around at the back. You know what's really nice as well is the good solid feel with which these doors close. Nice chunk. Really feels solid, feels very good. Now on the inside, it's not quite as global as we expected and the interiors are really a mixed bag with some very nice bits and some bits that disappoint. Let's begin with those that I didn't like. The car we had was the one with the black and brown interior and there's so many bits of black and brown that it all felt a bit too much. Also the black area on the dash and the top of the doors with its soft touch textured look is much richer in appearance than the brown making a glaring contrast between the two. The central console follows a waterfall design with a wooden finish in the centre edged by two chrome plastic strips. These strips cause a reflection into the windscreen that stands up right to the top and is quite disturbing to the driver. The plastic on the buttons on the central console again, another flat matte brown plastic that lands up looking a little cheap. Overall, it's too many textures and finishes for me. Aside, there are a lot of nice bits on the inside as well, like the floating binnacle, very xylo-like that houses two smart dials, circle within circle, surrounded by nice chrome rings. There's a touchscreen multimedia display which comes with the higher end, and the rotary dials for the audio and AC that are very nice quality. For the high end, you also get the satellite navigation and you can add on a video function. The music system has aux and USB connectivity too. The AC vents are another very nicely designed feature allowing good airflow and again the rotary vent adjusters here are extremely good quality. There is storage just about everywhere on the inside and you'll never lack for place to keep stuff. There's two glove box areas, there's nets near the feet for the front passengers, there's door pockets with bottle and umbrella holders, central storages and even places for the third row to store stuff. The only place space is lacking is in the boot. 
With seven seats up, there's literally no space. But you always have the option of folding down the seats to accommodate luggage. At the other end, under the hood, is the m -Hawk engine which has been upped in power and now has 140 bhp with 33.33 kgm of torque. Now the m -Hawk engine is an engine that we've always really liked and it feels extremely nice in the XUV500. This is light because of its monocoque construction and of course the power has been upped. It's extremely drivable, I've dropped down to 1000 rpm in third gear, I can still put my foot down and it moves on. There's a hint of lag just below 1500 rpm and then you hear the turbo whistle and it kicks in. Thereafter it pulls cleanly to the red line. The top end of this engine is also extremely nice, 130, 140, it's just effortless. It's a very refined engine and when you're cruising, you don't hear it at all. It's only when you rev hard, you hear it and that's much more the turbo whistle than a clatter. This engine is really comfortable in city traffic or on the highway. There's a tall third gear and you hit almost 140 in it. It just pulls and pulls all the way to the red line. It's a pretty enjoyable engine and you never lack for power. This engine is mated to a six-speed gearbox which requires a little more effort to use than we would like. The second gear in particular feels notchy and is a little too far back when you shift. Well, that's about performance. For those of you worried about economy, there's a stop-start feature which can be activated by a button on the central console. And M&M claimed that this vehicle has an average of 15.1 km per litre. One of our gripes always with the M&M vehicles was the way that they would handle and the ride quality. But with the new monocoque construction, this has changed quite drastically. This car feels extremely stable even at high speeds and when you want to do a little bit of uh, harder cornering, the steering gives you quite a lot of feedback, the body control is quite good and you don't ever feel unsafe throwing this car around. If at all, I felt that the tyres didn't offer up enough grip. Better tyres would have allowed me even more leeway. The steering too is not entirely consistent around corners, but that's when you're cornering really hard. In normal conditions, it's adequately responsive and still light and easy for city traffic. I couldn't tell much about ride quality being on a test track, but the back seat definitely left me impressed. It's like a football field at the back over here. Look how much space I have. Ashley's 5'6", I'm 5'4". And look at the amount of legroom over here. I mean, I can actually fit another person between me and the front seat over here. Even the third passenger is going to be as comfortable because the central console doesn't come as far back as it does in other cars. The floorboard is actually flat, so the third passenger has as much legroom pretty much as I do. Plus, there is width, so three abreast will be very comfortable in the back seat of this car. The third row is as good as the likes of the Innova as far as space is concerned. But there are additional nice touches like the AC vents and a fan blower control plus storage spaces. The seats themselves, third row or middle row, are comfortable and long journeys will be quite easy. Low speed ride is pretty good. This dismisses all the bumps, potholes. Um, you don't feel anything sharp filtering through and it's quite silent as well. This car is really well insulated. So here in the back seat, you feel pretty cut out from the outside world. No tyre noise, no wind noise, no sounds from the outside really filtering in. I don't know about traffic noise because I don't have too much of it around, but it feels really well insulated. It was too short a stint to get a good perspective on ride, so I'll have to tell you more when we do a more detailed test. But I can safely say, it's still a comfortable place to be. Now the XUV may not have the stance of the Endeavour of the Fortuner and its likes. But 
Though it's compact in its exterior dimensions, the kind of space it offers on the inside is really incredible. And if you're not into true blue off-roading, the all-wheel drive option is good enough and it comes with a differential lock which allows you to stay in four-wheel drive permanently too, if you like. So if you're looking for an SUV and you think that the Fortuner and the Endeavour are too big and bulky and maybe out of reach, and on the other side you don't want an MUV, well, the XUV 500 is just the answer. So India's first homegrown global SUV and I've enjoyed my stint out with it. Now there's something I didn't find quite global with it just yet, it's the interiors and I'm not talking about styling because that's really nice, I'm talking more about quality, just doesn't feel up to the mark yet. But in saying that it's still a huge leap forward for anything we've seen from M&M before. And of course this SUV just has so much more going for it. Everything from the styling, the way it looks, it's comfortable, it's spacious, it's got an engine that's really going to put a smile on your face when you drive it. It handles nicely, it's got good ride quality, it sort of ticks off all the boxes. But the icing on the cake is really the pricing. It's amazing value for what you get. Would I go out and buy an XUV 500? Most definitely. The 2011 Frankfurt Motor Show was packed. Earlier, we brought you all the India-centric cars, and this week, we bring you the dreamy concepts and the exotic supercars. One sleek and hot concept that caught my attention was at the Ford stall. This swell GT car wowed the crowds with its four gullwing doors and a full glass roof. But the main talking point here is the design, as it gives us a clue of what future Fords will look like. The EVOS concept is basically an evolution of Ford's kinetic design philosophy. And here in version 2.0, the EVOS has been given a more technical and premium feel. The upside-down trapezoidal grille, the slim headlights and the simple fog lamps will be the family identity in the future. The slim headlights, however, might not make it to all cars. On the power front, the EVOS concept is powered by a 2-litre Atkinson petrol engine with electric motors to provide clean and efficient transportation. Well, Audi is injecting some enthusiasm into the electric car concept here with the urban city car and uh, with the freestanding wheels and the fighter jet canopy and 2x2 two two seating, it just looks fabulous. The urban concept's massive grille dominates its face. For futuristic coolness, the roof slides backward to reveal staggered seating for two. Its 480 kilo weight also accounts for the two electric motors that are mounted at the rear. Total 20 bhp of power doesn't sound like much, but Audi claims a 0 to 60 km hour time of 6 seconds. To make things more enjoyable, the roof can be kept open to give you a motorcycle-like wind-in-the-hair experience. On the practicality front, the urban concept has a range of 73 km, which isn't all that practical. But rapid charging can top the batteries up in 20 minutes or 1 hour if you use a regular power outlet. The coolest bit? The urban concept can also be charged wirelessly using contactless induction charging. BMW had their electrically powered i3 and i8 on display. These concepts point the way to the future of BMW. The i3 is slated to go on sale in 2030. There's extensive use of carbon fibre and recycled aluminium. Also, decades after most cars ditch their separate chassis in favour of stiffer all-in-one bodies, the i3 will have two distinct structural elements, the life and drive modules. The first designed to accommodate the car's passengers, the second its drivetrain. It boasts of a 150 km top speed, a 9.7 seconds 0 to 100 and a range of about 160 km. Now just like Audi's urban concept, VW had a concept for urban mobility for 2030. This all-electric concept had a similar theme. But the Nils concept here is only a single-seater. When I hopped in, it felt very serious. 
it looked like it was production ready. The NILS concept uses lithium ion batteries and a compact ultralight motor that weighs only 19 kilos. The motor delivers 20 bhp of power to the rear wheels, but it can also pump out 33 bhp in short spurts. A recharge time of 2 hours from a regular plug point and a range of 65 kilometers seems perfect for the commute to office. And yet, it has space to store your briefcase as well. Well, guess who's got an SUV in the family now? Well, in the Fiat family of the premium range, it is Maserati that's been given an SUV. This is the Kubang concept. It's been called a concept right now, but it looks quite production ready. And it is actually slated to go into production in 2013. Now, the Kubang is a result of the capabilities acquired by the Chrysler and Fiat collaboration. With four-wheel drive know-how from Jeep and super engines from Maranello, Maserati is looking towards taking on Porsche's Cayenne. Well, that's all the concept cars of tomorrow, and now it's time to enjoy all the eye candy. Now, the SLK has always been an attractive little number, and this one will be all the more attractive when it comes to India, because this is powered by a diesel engine with 205 bhp on tap. The second generation SLK unveiled earlier this year is a more advanced car. It's sporty as before and even keeps its folding hardtop. We can expect it on Indian roads in the first half of 2012. The Super Trofeo is an ultralight Gallardo that looks unbelievably stunning. The massive rear wing and the contrasting red and black paint job is absolutely head-turning. Straps instead of door handles on the inside and carbon fibre everywhere means that this Lamborghini is lighter by 70 kilos when compared to the standard Gallardo. And it also comes with 570 bhp of power. That's 10 more than normal. And to celebrate the 150 years of the unification of Italy, Lamborghini will make only 150 Super Trofeos. Now, as hot as the Super Trofeo Stradal may be the biggest news for me from Lamborghini at Frankfurt. Although, Lamborghini will make only 20 units of the Sesto Elemento. Meanwhile, Renuka was taking a look at the rebirth of an icon. So some serious eye candy for me now, the all-new Porsche Carrera 911. Now this is the third time only ever that they built an all-new Carrera. The rest of them have all been evolutions of the previous cars. Highlights of this car for me, lots of aluminium in the construction, keeping it very light. Seven-speed manual transmission, it's got an electric power steering now. And of course the fact that it has a much longer wheelbase, so more car and more for you to feast your eyes on. Now whilst I really enjoyed this, there was a mixed reaction over the new 911 at the Frankfurt Motor Show. While some people drooled like me, others felt it was too long and stretched out. Now, according to me, the 458 Spider is absolutely spectacular in terms of looks. I think this is the best 458. If you have to have a 458, this is the one. And to drive, I think it will be divine. Yeah, after all, you know, with the roof down, you'll hear the engine that much more. And Ferrari, keeping that in mind, have to in the exhaust to make it all the more melodious. The 458 Spider looks spectacular. Power remains unchanged. That's 462 bhp from the 4.5 litre V8. This Ferrari drops its stop in 14 seconds and all the weight has increased. The Spider is actually 25 kilos lighter than previous Ferrari convertibles. No surprise then that 0 200 is dispatched in 3.5 seconds. That's same as the coupe. And all the top speed is down by 5 km per hour. Who can care? Imagine doing 320 km an hour with the roof down. The two piece fold away roof is a brilliant design. It springs up in a jiffy. The only complaint here now is that you can't see the engine sitting midships. And there was one more convertible that made its debut at Frankfurt. The most striking bit about the SLS has been removed. The convertible will actually be welcomed by many enthusiasts as the gulving doors felt a bit forced on it. 
it retains its massive 6.3 litre 563 bhp motor. While frame weight has gone up by just 2 kilos, overall the SLS is heavier by 40 kilos. The cloth roof can be put into place in a mere 11 seconds for protection from the elements. The SLS now also features electronically adjustable suspension. Although top speed is limited to 317 km an hour, the SLS's appeal is now sky high. Now the 4C really wowed the crowds when it was launched in Geneva earlier this year as a concept and well it's come back for another showing here in Frankfurt and it looks pretty much the same. Well actually only the paint scheme has been changed which is really good news because this car is going to go into production in 2013. I don't know how much will change by then but it looks like this works and I would love to see this in India. This compact sports car from Alpha has to achieve some very aggressive targets. The 4C will use aluminum extensively to keep weight down. Power will be delivered by a modest 1.7-litre engine that uses a turbocharger to deliver upwards of 200 bhp. The 4C is expected to be around 4 metres long with a wheelbase of 2.4 metres. Now that is a tight package. Now let's hope the price doesn't get too inflated. Though just from a design standpoint, the 4C is an absolute stunner. Its creased sinew and muscular flanks and rear look spectacular. We say bring it on! We're just about to go down to the stage and present this, which is the Women's World Car of the Year. Top honor to the BMW 5 Series. I'm part of that jury and I'm all excited to go down and make this presentation. 18 women journalists around the world vote for the Women's World Car of the Year. Unfortunately, all could not be at Frankfurt, but a few of us made it. At this particular presentation, there was Henny Hemmers from Netherlands, Sandy Mira from New Zealand, who's also the chairperson, along with me. This year's top award was a tie, so along with BMW 5 Series, the Citroen DS3 was also Supreme Winner of the Year. What does it feel like to receive a Women's World Car of the Year trophy? It's very important to us and uh, I know some of the jurors personally and uh, they're very tough journalists, so to get an agreement, uh, I'm really proud that the 5 Series was the winner. Come on the right. We are very proud that uh, it has been recognized by uh, a jury of uh, female worldwide and it's a uh, great honor for us. I didn't make it to all the presentations as I was busy bringing the Frankfurt Motor Show to you, but I did make it to one more which I enjoyed, Aston Martin. So we're here at Aston Martin where we're about to present the Women's World Car of the Year trophy to the Rapid. Of course, with the outstanding uh, proportions in design, uh, they should attract women. And to this comes the practicality, the smoothness, the reliability, the easiness uh, 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 to, to, to drive this car. So I'm not totally surprised about the car because I know it very well, but I'm still uh, very, very pleased uh, to receive this award. 